Greetings from Mesa View United Methodist Church of Albuquerque, New Mexico. We hope this message will be meaningful and relevant to your life and your relationship with God. We invite you to join us for worship on Sunday mornings. Our traditional service is at 8.30 a.m. and at 11 a.m. we gather for contemporary worship. More information may be found at our website, mesaviewumc.com. Now may you be blessed through the reading and hearing of God's holy word. The gospel reading is found in Matthew 38 through 48. The readings may be found on page 4 in the New Testament. <coughs> you have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, do not resist an evildoer. But if anyone strikes you on the right cheek, turn the other also. And if anyone wants to sue you and take your coat, give your cloak as well. And if anyone forces you to go one mile, go also the second mile. Give to everyone who begs from you, and do not refuse anyone who wants to borrow from you. You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, so that you may be children of your Father in heaven. For he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good, and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet only your brothers and sisters, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same? Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. In the eighth chapter of John, we find a story with which most of us are familiar. John is, I mean, Jesus is teaching in the temple. When the scribes and the Pharisees bring a woman who has been caught in adultery, the punishment for which is to be stoned to death. Of course, the questions we want to ask right away, which is how do you actually catch her in the act? And second is where is the man? It takes two to tango, and he's just as guilty of the, the crime and of the punishments by Levitical code. But neither of those questions are asked or answered. Instead, the scribes and Pharisees say to Jesus, what do you want us to do with her? It's Jesus' response that is the most famous, which is, let anyone who is among you who is that without sin cast the first stone. Now it's important to remember where this scene is taking place. That is, at the temple is where people would have brought their sin offerings to be given to God. So this isn't just a mental exercise that Jesus is doing about knowing you're a sinner. They would have been surrounded by everything that would have reminded them from the smells and the sights. Everything in their senses would have reminded them that they too had made that journey to the temple to make sin offerings on their own behalf. And so when Jesus says, let he who is without sin cast the first stone, they realize they are all sinners and they begin to leave the temple, eventually leaving just Jesus and the woman there. And Jesus tells her, just as those who have brought you here have not condemned you, so I do not condemn you. And then he says, go your way, and from now on, do not sin again. So today we continue in our series looking at the knots of Jesus, those injunctions of things we are not supposed to do. You might have thought that I would have chosen this passage from John to talk about not sinning. Except that I want to do something a little bit different today when we're looking at this idea of how we are not to, to sin. And it's going to be different than how we looked at the junction not to fear or not to, to doubt. And it would also be very different from how other preachers might ha have approached this text, in particular non-Methodist preachers. Because I'm going to be talking about you a position that's uniquely Methodist, uniquely Wesleyan, that is John Wesley, the founder of the Methodist movement, and how we should look at this injunction of not sinning 
And in particular, how we should see Jesus' injunction in that passage we heard from Matthew from the Sermon on the Mount, to be perfect as our Father in heaven is perfect. So when looking at fear and doubt, I said that I didn't think that Jesus was actually saying that we should have no fear or no doubt, that instead we should face them and move through them in order to deepen our faith lives. Now, some preachers might argue that I'm totally wrong on that, that we should look, look at what Jesus says literally and say there should be no fear and there should be no doubts, that we should be working on eliminating those from our lives. But then they would look at this passage from Jesus today saying that we should be perfect as our Father in heaven is perfect. And they say, well, that's sort of metaphorical because we can't truly overcome the power of sin in our lives. That's because they have a Calvinist perspective of the, of the world, coming from John Calvin, one of the Protestant leaders. And who said that, you know, we're, there's nothing redeeming about mankind. We're totally depraved in everything that we do. Sin rules in our lives. Now, I, as a Methodist preacher, follow the theology of John Wesley and also of Jacob Arminius, who was stood in opposition at the same time as John Calvin to propose a different way of being. And so looking at this passage of, of understanding to be perfect as our Father in Heaven is perfect, John Wesley said that we are to move on to perfection, known as Christian perfection, or the, the proper theological term is entire sanctification. So now you can go to work tomorrow and say, Church, we talked about entire sanctification. They'll have no idea what you're talking about, and they'll sound really important. <laughs> so when you've heard me say before, we're moving on to perfection, this is what I'm talking about. It's a uniquely Wesleyan or Methodist idea that we can attain perfection in this life. And in fact, six months before his death in 1792, John Wesley said the idea of Christian perfection was the grand depositum which God has lodged with the people called Methodists. And for the sake of propagating this chiefly, he appeared to have raised them up. That is, Wesley is claiming that the reason why the Methodist church is growing and expanding at the rate it is is because of this idea of Christian per perfection and God wants this propagated to the entire world. But to understand what it means to be perfect, we have to understand Wesley's understanding of God's grace, because perfection is part of God's grace. So before we begin to even know that we need God, before we begin to understand what sin is or brokenness, before we begin to understand that what forgiveness is or mercy, God's grace is already there for us, called provenient grace, the grace that goes before. Now, this has become a sort of more standard belief for the, the church, for the Protestant church in particular, even for people who believe in limited atonement, that Christ only died for a few, they sort of now sort of accepted provenient grace, although in a radically different way, because Wesley said that God's grace is available to everybody. And the way that Wesley talked about it was uniquely his own at the time. So God's grace is there, is available for everyone, is waiting for us to understand it and to understand our need for it. Which becomes to the point when we, we realize that we live broken lives, we live broken relationships with each other, we live broken relationships with God, and there's nothing we can do to solve that problem. As hard as we might try, as much as we might fight and struggle, we can't fix those relationships. That we need something more powerful than we are. And we realize that person is Christ. And so when we realize that and we say, Christ, I want you in my life. I need your forgiveness. And we ask for forgiveness. That's called justifying grace. And Wesley said at the moment that we are justified, that we should be transformed in our being. That we should die to our old selves and be reborn in this, this moment. That we should be fundamentally different people. And the more we understand about the need for forgiveness, the more we understand about the depths of God's love for us. And we understand this work can only be done by God. We cannot do it. And we cannot earn it. So now this is where it gets a little more complex, and we could talk about this for weeks on end, but I'm not going to subject you to that. 
Because it becomes like arguing how many angels can dance on the head of a pin. But these are important things for different sides of the church. Because at the moment of justification, when we accept Christ into our lives, there is a, a portion of the church that says that's the most important thing. That it is your personal relationship with Jesus Christ is the end all and, and be all. This is what's known as personal holiness. And so it's about our relationship with God, and about our relationship with Christ, and what we do and what we say is all working towards that peace. There's a passage from Ephesians which says, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing, it is the gift of God, not the result of works so that no one may boast. That is that we are saved by faith alone. Protestant belief. And we, there's nothing we can do to earn it, because if we did, then we could boast about how good we are in Christ. It's given to us freely and without cost. And that's the primary emphasis of the one side of the church. Now, there's another side of the church that says that's great, and it's good to have a relationship with God, but it's how we live out our, our faith. Social holiness. It's about going out and feeding the hungry and clothing the naked and visiting those who are sick in prison. They say that's what the, the religion's all about, is how we live that out in our lives. And so they look to exactly that same passage of Ephesians, which continues... For we are what God has made us, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand to be our way of life. We're saved by faith alone, but then we are called to the good works that God has already laid out for us. So you have these sort of two dichotomies of the church. Personal holiness, seeking relationship with God, and social holiness, seeking to live out our faith. Now, one of the geniuses of Wesley was working to combine those two things, to combine head and hearts and personal and social holiness. That Wesley would say that we have to have that moment in our lives when we say, here I am, Lord. I want you in my life. And that's an important thing to do, to accept Christ's saving actions on our behalf, to realize it has nothing to do with us and to be transformed in that moment be fundamentally different people. But then he would say, we say, here I am, to also say, send me. That those two things are connected together. We first accept Christ into our lives, then we say, how do we live that out? And we can see that in the first rules that Wesley propagated for the Methodist societies. We now call them the three simple rules. Talked about them quite a while ago. Does everybody remember what rule number one is? Do no harm. That's right. And second rule? Do good. Those are social holiness rules. Things we, how we live out our faith. And then the third rule was? Stay in love with God. Personal holiness. And what Leslie said is that all of these things build on each other. If we're doing no harm and we're doing good, that will lead us to staying in love with God. And if we're staying in love with God, it will lead us to doing no harm and doing good. Those things cannot be separated from each other. That we have to have personal and social holiness at the same time. A personal relationship with Christ and living our faith life out. And as we build on those, then we move from justification out to sanctification. And for us, what we call entire sanctification, Christian perfection. But before we talk about what that looks like, let's talk about what that is not. What being perfect does not mean. First is it doesn't mean that it's static. When we say something is perfect in English, we mean that there's nothing else that could be improved to it, right? It's, it's the absolute best it could ever be. Mm -hmm. But in the Greek, the, the word actually means that it's sort of a, a moving on to something else. It's like... You know, if you always go half the distance to, towards something, you'll never get there. Perfection is the same way. It's not that we ever reach entire perfection and we're done. There's still one more step we might be able to take, and one more step beyond that. It's something we're constantly striving towards, not something we ever fully achieve. The second thing is that it does not free us from ignorance or from making mistakes. If you are a terrible speller, 
You will still be an enti a terrible speller even if you've reached entire sanctification. <laughs> if you have had ignorance or been taught the wrong thing, it will still be there. So, for example, if you root for the Red Sox on this side of it, you're still going to root for the Red Sox on the other side because it's ignorance and wrong teaching. <laughs> even if it leads you to an unhappy life, it won't go away. So Christian perfection won't solve those problems for you. Perfection does not mean that we are freed from temptation. Christ was tempted. What it means is that hopefully we are fulfilled with sufficient grace so that those, we don't give in to those temptations. Not that they're not there, it's just that we don't follow them. It does not free us from the infirmities of life, including does not give us complete knowledge. What Wesley said is that finite people cannot have infinite knowledge. You don't gain more knowledge because you are moving towards sanctification or perfection. It also does not free us from illness or disease. It does not free us from abandoning the worshiping community, the body of Christ. Not only because of the example we can serve for our brothers and sisters in this journey of faith, but also because perfection is something we're always moving slightly more towards, others can also help to deepen our faith on this journey, even if we're really close to being entirely perfected. It also does not free us from not having to engage in the world. In fact, the closer you get to sanctification, the more you have to be out in the world. You can't shut yourself up in a room and say, if I go out there, there's going to be all these temptations, and people, somebody's going to be, do something stupid, I'm going to have to respond to it, and it's going to grow in my life. Right? The more we get to it, the more we're living out our faith, the more we find that we have to be out in the world, the more we find that we have to be doing good things in the world. And finally, being perfected does not mean that we are without sin. Wesley never used the term sinless perfection. So what it means instead is that when Jesus was asked, what is the greatest commandment? He said, it's to love the Lord your God with all your hearts and all your mind and all your strength and all your soul. All that we have to give it over to God. And the second is just like it, to love our neighbors as ourselves. And so what Wesley understood to be the movement towards perfection, what he said, what are the marks of a Methodist? We love God and we love our neighbor." And so what he understood was that, that love, when we try to live that way in our lives, that love is not just present in our lives, that love is in control of our lives, so that all of our thoughts, words, and actions are governed by pure love. So that we are so full of the love of God that we can no longer willfully sin. Doesn't mean that we won't sin. We're just not doing it willfully anymore because we're so guided by God's love in our lives. So moving on to perfection is not saying when you wake up in the morning, today I'm going to try not to sin. It's to say, how can I live God's love out today for my neighbors? And how can I give everything I have to God? Easy to do, right? Of course not. But the key to remembering how we do this is to remember it's not up to us. Just as being justified, accepting Christ, being saved by faith is not up to us, so moving on to perfection is not up to us either. We have to rely on God to help us through this process. We have to understand that we need God to do this with us and for us. And what does that look like? Well, in that passage that we heard from Matthew, when Jesus says, be perfect, he's given some examples of what that looks like beforehand. And so he says, if somebody strikes you, don't retaliate, turn the other cheek. And if somebody requests something of you, if they're begging from you or taking you to court, give more than what they have requested of you. I hope you remember that when I come to ask you something. <laughs> To love and pray for your enemies. These are not what we're taught to do. These are not what society says we should be doing. This is to live a fundamentally different way. To be transformed by the love of God. And that's why it's so hard. 
G.K. Chesterton said, Christianity has not been tried and found wanting. It has been found difficult and not tried. That's where we have to come back to the understanding. We can't do this alone. When we say the Lord's Prayer, we say, Thy will be done. So do we mean that? Or are we just mouthing the words? Thy will be done. We can't do this without God. <coughs> When Wesley was challenged on the idea of Christian perfection, which happened a lot, still happens, one of the, the hardest things in ecumenical dialogue is our position on Christian perfection in, in relation to other churches. But Wesley said, if John, God tells us that we are to love him with all that we have, all of our hearts and all of our minds and all of our soul and all of our strength, all means all, everything. And to say that we can't do that says that God's will can't be done. God says we are to do this, so therefore God's will should be, be able to be accomplished in this life. That we should be able to be transformed by grace to be so full of the love of God that that's all that we seek to do. And if we say that that's not possible, that sin is so powerful in our lives, then what we do is say is that sin is more powerful than God's grace. Do we believe that sin is more powerful than grace? I'm going with grace myself. So what does it look like when we achieve, or at least get closer to entire sanctification? Wesley said that humility and patience are the surest proof of an increase in love. <coughs> Humility and patience. Patience is a virtue, so you should hurry up and get some. <laughs> he said it looks like the fruits of the spirits. Love, joy, peace, patience, goodness, kindness, gentleness, self-control. It looks like 1 Corinthians 13 when Paul talks about what love is. That love is patient and kind, not jealous or boastful. It's not arrogant and rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not um, irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice in wrongdoing, but in the right. It bears all things, believes all things, endures all things. That's what it looks like when we live it out in our lives. Now, I look at that and I say, man, I'm a long way from entire sanctification. And the good news for the gentleman in the room is that Wesley did accept the testimony from some people that they had been entirely sanctified, but all of the ones he accepted were from women. I think that's because Wesley, as a man, understood what men are like, and he himself never said that he achieved entire sanctification. The bad news is that it's never a permanent state, even for those whose testimony he accepted. They didn't stay there. First, because it's something we're always moving on to. We're always one step. And the second, because every day is brand new. And we can wake up and say, Lord, let everything I do to be to your good, good and glory today. And somebody cuts us off in traffic and it all goes away, right? Because what Wesley said is it's a sliding scale between justification and sanctification. And some days we're doing really good. Some days, not so good. We're sliding back and forth on this scale, but we're moving on to perfection. Which means we have to remember again that we cannot do this alone. We have to ask for God's strength and God's guidance in order to undertake this process. And to continue to ask for God's forgiveness. And every day to get up and to seek to do God's will in the world. Say, your will be done. But here's the last piece of good news, and that is there is a Jewish story that says when we are born, all of us have a string that attaches us to God, sort of a spiritual umbilical cord. And when we sin, that string gets broken. One of the reasons I like this story, because I think that's what sin is, brokenness. And when we break that string, we're separated from God. So the way we get back to that is to ask for God's forgiveness, and we tie a knot in our string. Now from a Christian understanding, we understand that Jesus ties a knot in our string, 
Should have cut up a little longer. <laughs> so much for that example. Here we go. Let me cut it on there. Lord, forgive me. That worked perfect in my preparation. <laughs> so Christ ties this knot for us. And we're reconnected back to God. This is the Jesus knot. And we get re reconnected. But each time we sin, that string gets cut. And we have to ask for forgiveness and we get broken back, tied back into it. But what we find is that the longer we go on, <laughs> the more knots you get, but the shorter the string gets. The more we sin and ask for forgiveness, this is not, oh man, if I go out and do a lot of bad things, I get closer to God. That's not what I'm saying. <laughs> But the more we understand the need for God's grace, the more we understand God's love in our life, the closer we get to God. And we realize we can't do it alone. So Jesus tells us to be perfect as our Father in heaven is perfect. Which we interpret to mean, love the Lord your God with all that you are, and love your neighbor as yourself. To remember that it's not up to us. That we are reliant upon Christ to be transformed. And once we are transformed, to go out and be transformative. Not through our power, but through the power of the Holy Spirit. And through the power received through our face, as we hear in Galatians, it is no longer I who live, but it is in Christ who lives in me. In the life I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith in the Son of God who loved me, and gave himself for me. I pray that it will be so, my brothers and sisters. Amen. Amen.